Welcome everybody to another author interview. Today I am extraordinarily excited to bring you once again Brandon Sanderson in anticipation for the release, which is actually coming out today, of Rhythm of War. How are you doing today, Sanderson? I'm doing all right. Yeah, feeling pretty good. A lot of this stuff that normally I have to do on release week, we've been doing leading up to release week because so much of it is digital. Which means normally when a re release is coming, I have like a sense of dread. Not because I don't think the book will do well, um, but because it usually means three weeks of furious, frantic work for me, traveling all around the world, uh, signing books, staying up until 2 a.m. Uh, I could talk for, for hours about uh, touring and stuff, but this time I don't have to do any of that, and we're doing so much of it up front that it's feeling really nice. Like I signed 7,000 copies of the book last week, and this week, and that's done. Like, I don't have to do any more signing, which is just bizarre to me. <laughs> that sounds like a, one of the few advantages of the state of things is you can just yeah. prep it from home. Um, and Rhythm of War has been so highly anticipated. On my end of things, it's the clear, like, most hyped book in the fantasy circles of the year. How has that been reflected on your guys' end? Are you just constantly inundated with fan questions and when's it coming out? Or has it been, because of the change situation, pretty mellow? Um, I'd say it's right in the middle, right? I'm pretty communicative with people. And so there's a general normal, like I, I communicate with people on Reddit and we get the fan mail and things like that. That's been hyping up a bit. It's been ramping up. We get a little bit more of it around this time of year. But because I'm so steady with it, it's a little less uh, frantic. Like, um, a lot of people who want to contact me do it through the Reddit threads where I've been posting um, annotations of chapters of the book, right? And so that gives a chance for people who are in the know to go and chat with me a little bit or make comments and things like that. And so because it's been structured, it's actually been <clears throat> pretty easy. Uh, we probably will do an AMA, and those are insane. Um, but yeah, it's it's been good. Pre-orders are way up. Tours like super happy um, over last time. Um, I don't focus a ton on that, right? But it is when the publisher's happy, I'm happy. So that's good. That's fantastic to hear. And in true Sanderson fashion, you've managed to do this on hard mode once again, and now releasing Dawn Shard as well. Uh, so yeah, that was dumb of them. <laughs> yeah. you, you say hard mode. That was just dumb. Um, I should have learned my lesson with Edge Dancer, which we did kind of the same thing. I got it ready uh, really fast um, and things. But I knew I wanted to write this novella, and I knew that the Kickstarter would be the right time to present it to people. Um, but I shouldn't have done it. I should have, I should have either written it last year and released it this year, or I should have said, I'll write this next year, um, and release it. But, uh, yeah, uh, it actually turned out really well. I just, the, it leads to some frantic, uh, days, particularly for my team. Um, so as we're recording this, I think Don Shard should be going out right now to people. I'm very excited to read it, and I have heard kind of if the rumblings in the fan base that people are saying, are wondering, is this a must-read before Rhythm of War, or is it something that's just a good complimentary? How is the author, would you label it? I would label it as a complimentary. If you read this later, you will of course know a few things, right? You will know about, you know, people who survive. I don't think anyone is expecting Don Shard to include major deaths of main characters in the Stormlight Archive. There is a little scene uh, in an interlude in Rhythm of War, which takes place after this, that I wrote very deliberately to not spoil major plot points of Don Shard. Um, so really, I was trying hard to make sure that it wouldn't, it wouldn't be ruined either way. I would read it before if all things being equal. Um, but at the same time, I can imagine there are people who even get it who are like, you know, I'd rather just dive into Don Shard when I'm done with that and I want more. I've got this morsel that I can read a year from now to kind of, you know, stagger things between Stormlight uh, releases. It's really how you want to use it. I don't think you will get spoiled majorly either way. Certainly, Don Shard doesn't have any spoilers for Rhythm of War, uh, so you don't have to worry about that. But there are minor things in Rhythm of War that you'll be like, oh, that must have happened in Don Shard. All right, fair enough. And it's purely a digital release as of now, correct? Yes. Uh, there will be print editions to the Kickstarter backers. Uh, as soon as we can get those printed, COVID caused lots of random delays in lots of weird, strange places. Um, and one of the things we've had trouble in publishing industry is getting paper. 
um, and printer. Rhythm of War did not get affected, but while Rhythm of War was coming up to being printed, major books were just dropping like flies in the industry as they're like, we can't get the, the paper or the printing time, it's pushed back till next year. And we somehow navigated that with several near misses. Dom Shard is not uh, high on any printer's lists, um, and so we don't think we're going to get till January, maybe February. Um, we're hoping January. Um, but uh, for a print edition beyond that, not sure. Uh, we're, I like kind of experimenting with hybrid publishing, New York and indie publishing. And uh, the novellas are where we spend a lot of our indie publishing um, time. And we like to just try different things and see what works out the best. So It's good to hear that you guys are still able to get Rhythm War out without any hiccups. I know that would be a lot of fans yeah. <laughs> very, uh, very affected. Well, it is handy when... Um, even if you're not the biggest book in the world, you are definitely the biggest book at the publisher. And so that, uh, you know, that helps get things through at Tor. Uh, when we want to do something at Tor, it just kind of happens. Um, and they will move heaven and earth to make sure a Stormlight release happens on time. I, I, I figured that would be the case uh, with a lot of the, the flagship being Stormlight over there. And I actually have a lot of questions for fans because uh, I put out for what okay. do you guys want to ask Sanderson for Rhythm of War? And I actually want to kick one off that I thought was pretty interesting specifically for writing this one. The fan wanted to know, the development in every book has to have its own distinct challenges and growth for yourself as a writer. What is Rhythm of War for you in terms of where you felt you grew the most as a writer, and what do you think was the hardest uh, hurdle for writing this stage of the Stormlight Archive? So the hardest hurdle, I'll start with that one. Two hurdles for this one. First was the way that the structure of the Stormlight Archive uh, outline worked. Originally when you got here, we wouldn't have seen a lot of Parshendi culture. Um, that was just a thing. Then the original outlines on like, oh, we'll release, reveal that when we do Eshenai's flashback sequence, and it'll be very new and interesting and evocative because we're exploring a new culture. Well, as I started writing the books, by working on Words of Radiance, I knew that just was not going to fly. Um, I needed to start digging into this culture way earlier than I'd planned. Uh, it was a pretty easy change mentally to make. I'm like, no, this, this was wrong. The outline was wrong. But what it meant was, when I got to Esh and I's flashback sequences, some of the things I was intending to be um, the showpiece of an exciting part of it, of learning about their culture, we'd already talked about. Um, which left these flashbacks in an interesting position because I didn't have a lot of mystery left to them. And Kaladin, uh, Shalon, and Dalinar's flashbacks had been driven by mystery, right? I was able to, you know, do Kaladin's. When it, the book was fresh, no one knew. Um, and I hadn't, we hadn't spent a lot of time with the characters, and Shalon to an extent also with some of her psychological things. And then, of course, Dalinar, I had done the forgotten his, his past uh, thing, which just each gave me a chance to, uh, to keep that mystery. But with Esh and I and Venli, it was no longer there. Um, and so this is why I split the viewpoints between Esh and I and Venli, and I wrote the whole uh, draft, and I was pleased with it, but beta readers were kind of noticing the thing that I had worried. They're like, there's not a lot in these. Um, the, the, the sense of progress, you know, I always talk about this. The thing that is we're learning or we're experiencing that is making the, the story more interesting, this was just uh, the, uh, the flashbacks were um, a letdown after Dalinar. And that was inevitable, right? Dalinar has the best flashbacks. I think we'll have the best flashbacks through the first five, um, just because of how dynamically he changed and how I was able to use uh, young Dalinar being in a different kind of awesome uh, than old Dalinar. With, uh, with Even with Kaladin, you've got kind of young Kaladin who's kind of a, a dopey kid, and then grown-up Kaladin who's, who's really cool to read about. And there's only so much I could do with the dopey kid, right? And uh, with Dalinar, I could make it uh, very dynamic on both ends. And so what I had to do with Esh and I and Venli was try to, to soup it up how I could, right? In revisions, one of the things that I made sure to do is to give more progress, uh, to, to actually give, highlight Venli's arc. This is where splitting Venli out proved very useful. And I could also really dig into her in the modern day timeline uh, to just better make a more interesting story that uh, then kind of helped carry those flashback sequences a little bit more. Some readers, I think, will just be 
thinking, wow, this is awesome, this is new, this is different, but the really hardcore readers know basically everything that happened in these flashbacks already. They can piece it together through the timelines. So for them, I'm hoping that the arc that Venli goes on, the journey that she and that Esh and I has a little mini arc as well go on, is going to um, make up for the fact that you do already know about Parshendi culture um, in ways that, you know, the, the book series just needed to do. Uh, the other big challenge in this one in revision was uh, getting um, Shalon's disassociative identity disorder uh, to work authentically according to um, the experience of people who have a similar psychology to her and also to work on page in a way that was dynamic and interesting. And there, there's a bit of a dance to do here. Um, I thought that the second half of that would be harder than it ended up being because by changing it, to be more authentic to my beta readers' experiences. It actually made the story better for everyone. Um, a lot of the readers who weren't that dialed in on it were just really responding to these revisions um, in ways that uh, are, it's very gratifying. I'm glad that it worked so well, um, but I had thought that I'd need to do, do more balancing there. Uh, but getting Shalon right was a big uh, revision effort. It was uh, it was probably the hardest thing to do in this book because I, I talk, I've talked about this other places. Originally, when I started the Stormlight Archive, I was going to kind of hand wave it a little bit. I was going to be like, this is a fantasy disease, mental illness. Um, this is a fantasy and the solutions will be fantasy focused. And I do this with a lot of things. Uh, for instance, the war on the Shattered Plains, right? I specifically made the tactics such that modern military uh, experts wouldn't really be able to say what would work the best on the Shattered Plains because we haven't experienced anything quite like it, which allows me to kind of control and say this is the tactics they've come up with without me being, you know, a four-star general with, um, with 20 years of experience in military tactics, right? That's one of the advantages of fantasy. Um, and the, the big advantage of that is that people who do know military tactics can still read the books and enjoy them and be like, yeah, I could see how you come up with that. You know, it's realistic enough to work, but we don't know for sure how you would actually do things on the Shattered Plains. Them only having four years uh, as well is another sort of way that we can make it so that, you know, they haven't reached optimal battlefield tactics yet. So in case someone's worried, like, I don't know if they do this. Well, they've only been there for four years. It's okay. This is what I... I'm doing, for instance, with the Heralds. The Herald psychology is very Cosmere based. What's happening to them is uh, rooted in Cosmere magic systems and things like this. And I was going to go that way with Shalon. And the more I wrote Shalon, the more I felt that that would be irresponsible because I really was drawing on DID, um, I, you know, the, the symptoms and the effects and things from the DSM is what I was using to, to develop uh, her character. Um, and I realized last book, um, I was going to need for this book, I was going to need subject matter experts and I was going to need to do the hard thing, which was actually be realistic because if I didn't, it would be irresponsible um, because one of my mandates to myself is to authentically represent the life experience of people as best I can in these books. And I also want to be offering um, the realism also helps because a lot of people with uh with different mental disorders are often depicted in fiction and stories very poorly right uh, you can see this in schizophrenia the amount of times that schizophrenics in stories um are these uh evil uh characters when statistically a person with schizophrenia is much less likely to commit a crime in uh the real world and it's just this sort of um, thing that people have to deal with and, and DID in particular gets very sensationalized um, in the media and I realized if I went that direction I would be adding to that rather than trying to do what I could to add to the realistic depictions of, of people's mental experiences in my stories and so um, I, I sat down and did the, the hard thing but it meant a major revision after I got the uh it back from the subject matter experts because there's only so much i can learn i do spend a lot of time studying um, psych because it's something really interesting to me but this is one of those cases where i got the feedback and i realized now i have to do a really big revision to make sure i'm incorporating this and the 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 happy accident is that um everybody else liked it a lot better too things that it pushed me to do pushed me to take non-lazy paths in the narrative 
uh, which turns out when you take the non-lazy path of the narrative, it makes a stronger narrative, um, which is what we're always kind of trying to do anyway. Uh, so anyway, uh, those are my two big hurdles and challenges for this book. Uh, very pleased with how they both turned out, but that's where I was pulling my hair out in the early part of the year, figuring out how to make these revisions work. Well, I can tell you from my experience of reading Rhythm of War, it also comes across fantastically with the handling of anxiety in Kaladin, something from I suffer from, and it's probably one of the best representations of dealing with that I've ever seen. So I appreciate the effort from my perspective as well. But this kind of leads nicely into another question I had here, where you're tackling so many lofty ideas, themes, world building. How do you maintain like a strong, firm narrative thrust while also making sure to complexly and cohesively explore all these ideas you want to? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so I'll take this from two different directions. First one is I make sure that my rough draft, my first draft, character and story are most important. This is why I have to do all these revisions, right, uh, for something like DAD, because working on the rough draft, I am focused on character beats and narrative beats. Um, and I'm making sure that this story works, right? Like if I can't in the first draft make the book interesting and fun to read, that's a big problem. And Theme is much less important, and particularly in that first draft, and even accuracy is much less important than making sure that there's a story here that people will want to read. So draft one of a book is a proof of concept, which is why I, I always talk about you know reading draft one and even draft two. Um, I usually only want industry professionals to read because it is a proof of concept. It's a, this story works, what I want to do with it will work. Let's make sure and let's uh, let's see have people read it. And then I can fix a lot of the details. And it's interesting because things that are difficult um, to revise, like my my editorial team sometimes will bring up something and be like, man, this is gonna be a really terrible hard revision. I'm sorry, but you probably need to do this. And I'll talk to them and they're right. But it's actually not a hard revision because it's not fiddling with that core fundamental that I've laid down, right? Like really hard revisions are when you get to the end of the book and you look back and the book's boring, right? That's that's a hard revision. That's a, you have to take a long, hard look at what you've done. That's a 50 to 70% revision or throw the book away sort of thing. Or you get to the end of a big revision and one of the main characters just did not work. Dalinar from uh, the first draft of Way of Kings, right? Dalinar just did not work. That's a hard revision. And that's when I hit early and work hard on. Uh, for those who don't know, the solution to Dalinar and uh, Way of Kings was to split off part of his viewpoints to Adolin and create Adolin as a viewpoint character, which had not been in the original draft. In order to prevent Dalinar from feeling too wishy-washy, um, we needed him as a strong character uh, who you know, knew what he wanted and was going for it. And in the original draft, that wasn't the case. And so that's a hard revision. A lot of the revision things that people will suggest um, are not as hard as they sound. For instance, um, medium hard in this one was adding some new scenes for Venli in the present to really make her character arc work. That's easier than having a, you know, if I can add something to expand, easier than pulling everything out and starting over. The DID revision, medium hard, right? Um, uh, not as fundamental to the structure um, as some other revisions, but not as easy as something, say, um, can you cut 10% from this sequence to make it just zip a little bit more? That's an easy revision. I can do that. Uh, that means things are working, but we want to tighten. Uh, it's hard to find exact examples without having my revision guide in front of me. Basically, if I can lay down those fundamentals and then the, the, the 2.0 draft that people read and when I come back to and read when I'm working on the 3.0, if that works for character arcs and the emotion, the narrative, then we're golden. And that's, that's how I make sure that happens. The, the second answer to this, um, kind of coming in from the back end, is once that is laid down, then I have something to play with, to work with. Uh, that rough draft is a proof of concept. I often talk about writing a book for me being like creating a sculpture. If you watch any great sculptors, like they first get you know, a, they're making a bust of a person. It is just a blob that is only vaguely like it, but they've got the eyes in the right place, the nose in the right place, and the mouth, like the proportions are right. So that's what they're working on in that first draft. And when I've got something where the proportions are right, then 
I can do all kinds of fine tuning and chiseling and changing things and sculpting to really refine the experience. And that's where I can bring out things like theme. Theme is something that I just enhance that should have already been there from what the characters are um, fascinated by, where their character arcs are. What's really working in the book, I can enhance um, at that point. And during revisions, there are places where I'm like, no, this proportion was wrong. I'm going to have to knock that part off and redo it. You know, the ear is just completely in the wrong place or whatever on the sculpture. And this whole process is a slow refinement to getting to what hopefully looks like a really great depiction um, of a person in, uh, in this metaphor. So that that's really fascinating and it kind of makes me wonder back all the way to when you were first conceptualizing Stormlight Archive and you were really trying to get this idea forward, what parts of that came first to you? Was it the characters? Was it the themes, the world? How did this baby come into existence? And where were the actual like first ideas and sparks coming from? So the first idea for Stormlight was uh, Dalinar. Um, the very first seed of an idea. Uh, Dalinar is something I came up with when I was a teenager. Uh, this is one of the few ideas I came up with when I was a teenage writer at 17 or whatever that persisted. Um, and I want to tell a story about um, a kingdom where the king is assassinated, the son of the king, and this version way back then was too young to take the throne, so the brother takes over and finds out he's a really good king and it's his struggle of whether he should let go for his nephew when his nephew comes of age or whether he should just keep being king. Uh, that was an interesting conflict to me. Um, and that seed, that thread, wove all the way through a lot of different books until finally uh, it matured into Dalinar in the Stormlight Archive. The second seed of an idea for Stormlight was the um, High Storms. So when I was really developing the what we call Way of Kings Prime back in the early 2000s, I was noticing that one of the things I really enjoyed, this was before I was published, uh, one of the things I really enjoyed was doing a little bit more science fiction style world building for fantasy worlds. Um, I had grown up in an era where the fantasy worlds were very Tolkien influenced, which meant um, some sort of kind of medieval England uh, taken and fantasized, uh, lots of forests, lots of, you know, some race that lives in the forest, another race that lives in the mountains. These are, these are great books. Uh, there's no, no, no problem with them. But as I matured as a writer and I started to read things that were trying to kind of escape out of that from underneath that shadow, uh, George Martin and Robert Jordan uh, being examples, um, and, and some other things like Melanie Ron and her use of magic in the, uh, the early 90s and stuff like that, where we're going and I thought, this is, this is where I want to go. I, I want to be telling fantasy stories that take place in worlds that don't feel anything like uh, the fantasy worlds that I read growing up. Um, and the High Storm was my, one of my, I had several ideas back then, and the High Storm was the one that stuck out the most. This is the one that really clicked with me, um, that it, I hadn't seen done before. Um, it played into my strengths. I really like weather as kind of um, that per a character uh, and antagonist in the stories. You see this with the mists. Um, you'll see this with things involving the Aethers when I eventually write those stories. Uh, this is a big thing for me, and it was something I felt I could really expand upon. It felt it's something that hadn't been done, um, and it led me to some interesting ecological developments where I was uh, building this ecology and the flora and fauna, and I just really loved the visuals and the style and things like that. And so uh, High Storms really shaped a ton of it. Thematically, I had been reading a lot of books in the kind of post-token era which focus on the idea of magic leaving the world. Um, this was a, this was a sub-theme in Tolkien and then kind of rippled through uh, the very Tolkien-esque stories that magic is getting weaker, fewer people use magic. Uh, basically, in a lot of these worlds, uh, the fantasy worlds were becoming our world, right? Uh, uh, Terry um, Brooks did some of this, Robert Jordan did some of this. The idea that world used to be full of myths and magic and now it's becoming technology and things and I um, I felt a melancholy at that 
because the magic is things that I wanted. And so I wanted to tell a story about the restoration of the magic. The magic is coming back. This is a world that's been without for a while and things are changing and, um, and the magic is returning. Obviously not the first one to do this. This is the story of Star Wars. So uh, not, a, not an uncommon theme. It's just a lot of the books I had been reading had gone the other direction. And I always find myself zigging when what I've read is zagged mostly because the authors I've read did a really good job zagging, and I'm like, well, they've got that covered. Let's see where I can go a different direction. And so those are my th three things. Dalinar, High Storms, uh, restoration of a magic that has been gone for a while, uh, kind of coming again, uh, and kind of the one of the deeper dives into Cosmere-style magic systems with the bonds and things like that. That's very fair. So could we possibly see... 30 years from now, Sanderson take a stab at writing a Tolkien inspired with elves and goblins fantasy world, or is that just not appealing to you? It's not appealing to me right now. Um, I have no problem with these stories, as I've said. Uh, in my, the early 2000s, um, I had a bigger problem. Uh, I was less mature then. I'm like, why are all these books all the same? These, you know, uh, we got to stand up for not doing Tolkien stuff. And then I matured a little and realized uh, what people like to write and read is fine, whatever it is, right? Indeed, there are still fantastic works being made that are very Tolkien inspired. You could argue that, you know, the whole Black Library is uh, is a a fantasy, is a Tolkien derivative with, uh, with all of the Warhammer stuff and things. And they do some really cool stuff with their storytelling there. Um, and so, yeah, Mature Brandon uh, says, love what you love, write what you love, doesn't matter. The, all of the tropes, all of the setting stuff, this is just there to be a means to eject stories into people's brains and write what you find exciting. And don't be offended when other people write something that's different, because uh, that's what we want people doing. But it's not really exciting to me to write that. Um, partially because, again, my youth was spent reading really great works that explored this. Um, and I feel like fantasy did a really good job. Gen there's definitely more places to go, but I, I got my fill when I was younger. Um, and one of the things that I felt um, is that fantasy, like this is a personal theory of mine, Tolkien was very ahead of his time. There's really nothing like Tolkien before Tolkien in a complete secondary world fantasy built the way that he built it. Uh, you can find little hints here and there of people doing somewhat similar, but this he really did invent the epic fantasy genre just out of nothing. Well, out of classic um, heroic epics um, and things like that. Not out of nothing, but you know what I mean. Um, and uh, the genres, uh, the genre of epic fantasy had one guidepost for a long time and so spent a lot of time playing with that. If you don't know about the history of fantasy, like Thomas Covenant and Terry Brooks and David Eddings, uh, which were kind of three of the big um, fantasy series that started in the late 70s, early uh, 80s, all were directly trying to be Tolkien, um, an exploration of Tolkien. Uh, Thomas Covenant more on the literary side, and then uh, the other two more on the high adventure um, side. But uh, they drove fantasy for a long time. I feel like it took us a long time to get out of Tolkien's shadow, and justifiably so. I mean, there was a lot of room in that shadow to explore. And now that we're kind of stepping outside of it, which really started late 90s um, and things like that, I'm excited by the places the genre has been going in the last 20 years um, and don't see myself returning even though I'm sure there's plenty more to explore. Completely acceptable. How's that for a political answer to you? <laughs> I was going to say, completely acceptable take uh, right down the middle yeah. there. Mm. Um, but when it comes to uh, specifically uh, shifting quite a bit here, you've had a tremendous success recently on YouTube. And I have to selfishly ask from my perspective, how has that been for you to step into my turf? And also congratulations on the massive success. You, do you have a 100,000 uh, subscriber plaque yet? Yes, we got it. Um, I'm gonna let Adam hang it up because Adam, my publicist, in-house publicist, he's done all the work. All I do is sit in front of a camera and blab, <laughs> uh, which is something I'm very, very good at doing. No, it's been, it's been really fun because um, I watch a lot of YouTube. I really love video essays. Um, I really enjoy the kind of off the cuff interview form that happens. I probably watch more or at least equal YouTube to traditional television anymore, right? Um, because I, I like the takes that people are doing. I like the, uh, you know, the Lindsay Ellis's of the world who are saying, hey, let's, let's talk about this in an interesting way. I hadn't really given serious thought to it for a long time, but then, um, uh, 
we came up with this doing signings on YouTube uh, idea uh, because a lot of people were live streaming random stuff during the COVID, right? We can't get out and do things anymore. A lot of people are just randomly live streaming. I'm like, ah, let's, let's try it. Um, and it seems like people enjoy it. Uh, so any time I can use my time in multiple ways, then I'm excited. I don't consider myself a real YouTuber, right? Um, because this is a side hobby for me. Uh, more it's a, a way for my fans to, to interact with me, just like a lot of my social media is. Um, and so even when I do something a little more produced, I don't really consider myself a true YouTuber. But I do like to, uh, I do, do like to play in this world a little bit, and I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful for all those who make really great YouTube content. Um, kind of, it's a, it's, it's a new media, it really is. When they've tried to do really produced things, like, I mean, I watched Cobra Kai, which was really well done and things, but it doesn't feel like YouTube. YouTube should be, um, you know, this sort of indie publishing version of media, and I really like that aspect of it. And so, anyway. It's a good take, and I just want to say again, congratulations, because you are, you're saying it's not your full-time job, but you're hitting levels most YouTubers would dream of, especially in terms of live streaming numbers, so congrats there. Um, but I wanted to- Yeah, well, I cheat. <laughs> I, I cheat in a lot of things, right? A lot of the things that I try are successful because I'm already successful, which is unfortunately how things sometimes work. Well, it's success begets success. It's a, it's a true thing in life. Um, well, I was very fortunate recently on the channel to have two authors on, Evan Winter and Rebecca Kwong, and they were on polar opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of how they planned their books. Evan was, I have one draft because I plan so well, I don't get rid of any words, it's just done right Right away, whereas Rebecca Kwong talked about how she can write 100,000 words that will just not make the book and disappear. Uh, you've spoken quite a bit on how you develop as an author and how you kind of plot out your books. And for something like Rhythm of War versus Starlight, is that do you shift on where you fall in that spectrum at all, or are you solidly one type, one way? Like, did the original really have a different structure in that sense? I, I am a little different uh, for each book. Each book, book requires something different. Um, for the, the Skyward books, I've actually had to be very outline-centric because of the way the publishing schedule on those work and with the, the teen publisher, they just wanted a really solid outline. So I, I prepared that ahead of time. I normally probably wouldn't have done that. If there's a weakness to the Steelheart trilogy, it is that I didn't do as much of that, right? Um, and if there's a strength, maybe that's it as well. I tend to work better when I do have more of that structure, though I am I'm definitely not as far on the, the side of the one draft, right? If I have a good guidepost, books tend to do better, but it doesn't necessarily have to be really, really strict. There are books where as long as I know what the themes are for each character, the arcs for each character, and I know what the major storytelling points I'm trying to get, that one draft proof of concept, that first draft I mean, proof of contract concept stuff, if I have that in hand, I'm more likely I've found to create a strong novel than if I don't. But the Alcatraz books were all completely discovery written. Uh, they are also my least successful books. So, um, I don't know if that has to do with that. Actually, the, pro the reason that Alcatraz books are the least successful, I'm pretty sure, comes down to two things. Total tangent, sorry. But one is they are books that make fun of the reader as you read them, and some people just don't like a voice from a character who is kind of annoying, right? It's kind of irritating. Uh, some people love it, right? Um, but it's got that, that little sort of lemony snicket feel where the character's playing a joke on you the whole time. And then the other uh, aspect would be that they're targeted middle grade, but my middle grade humor was not on point, and it's more YA humor, it's more sarcasm, more what we would classically define as, uh, as YA or older humor, and it just did not hit. The kids would read it because they enjoyed the uh, story, but wouldn't get the humor. Or older kids would get the humor, but by then they were older than the characters and weren't bonding as strongly to the series in a lot of cases, so that's why I could have. But I also did Discovery write those completely. Uh, most of my novellas are more discovery written. The shorter the format, the less strong the outline has to be in a lot of cases. Like when I do a Stormlight book, I just I do a lot more upfront work. The outline's actually much less readable for a Stormlight book um, as well because it's an, the more I work on an outline, the more it targets toward what I need, not what an editor needs to understand, right? And so there's a lot of just 
random pieces and thoughts and things that work for the way that I work in an outline. For those who don't know, I'm usually focused on a goal and then lots of bullet points explaining how to get there and things I want to try that are going to make the, uh, the story pop when we get to that and they're going to be exciting along the way. Um, and that sort of stuff I don't think would make any sense uh, to anyone. Um, that said, for Rhythm of War, I did a big, long sort of explanation of what all the character arcs were and things uh, that included going into book five that I sent to my team and said, what am I forgetting? Is there anything I am not fulfilling here that really ought to be in the books? Uh, because we've only got one more book in this, this arc of the Stormlight, um, and there's a lot of things to wrap up in that book. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't leaving myself with uh, too much to do or too little to do. Um, and it's looking really good. I'm very excited by book five as well. Uh, book four and book five aligned really well. I love the confidence. Uh, and there's another kind of left turn question here, if you don't mind. But you are someone who seems to be really pushing on the cutting edge of the exploration of where new media can take being an author. Putting up chapters on YouTube, the live streaming, very engaged on Reddit, YouTube. From your perspective, as sales shift to being more audiobook and Kindle, is there anything that authors starting out now should really keep in mind how they advertise themselves, how they market their books as someone who has found great success in this area? Caveat asterisk that has to go before all of this, I broke in in the previous industry. I broke in in 2003, and 2005 is where the, the, the version of the world we live in for publishing started or 2010, 2010 is when it started. It's when the Kindle launched, it's when the first eBooks really took off, and it's when Audible really started to take off. Um, and so we live in a different era than when I broke in. Uh, so talking to people who, broke, who have broken in recently, they're probably gonna give you better advice than I will. Um, I do try to watch these things because I try to, as you say, um, be on the forefront of things. And one of the things we've done that is very successful that I would recommend all authors moving forward doing is take more control over your career. Um, I don't think um, most authors should be straight up traditional, or straight up um, indie in this market. I think they should be exploring both. Now, more likely that you should be straight up indie than you should be straight up uh, traditional. I think that anyone who's straight traditional right now, um, either they're doing it because they just don't want to worry about all this stuff, Brandon, which is valid, right? You don't want to have a whole business attached and have 20 employees totally understand that. Uh, you don't need 20 to do it, but even a couple employees you probably would need. Um, and so totally understand that. But number two, if you are straight traditional, you are probably um, leaving a lot of business on the table and are not growing uh, your fan base like you could. And I think that's just straight up true. I could be proven wrong, but I don't think that there's anyone traditionally published. Maybe, I don't know, maybe some of the old guard, but uh, these days doing something just as simple as I'm going to keep my own um, premium uh, volume rights, the leather bound as we call them, and doing your own leather bounds um, that you are selling at conventions or through your website. Uh, leather bounds traditionally have been bad business for traditional publishing. It's why they don't do them very often. It's why you don't see very many because they have low print runs and high costs, which means the margins are very bad. We're getting very technical that now, but when, when Tor did the Wheel of Time leather bounds, they cost $250 a piece and Tor lost money on them. And this is because um, if you're going to sell through retail, which the, the main publishers all still do, um, what that means is... Uh, oh, you have the, the recovers the wheel of time. Sorry. Uh, the, 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 yeah, I love those. Um, but if you're going to be doing this um, as a publisher, 50% or so is going to the retailer. And the retailers won't order many copies or they'll just order like a billion, right? The leather bounds you get through Barnes & Noble are a different story uh, in their program. But most of the time, they're just not going to order many copies. Fans won't know where to get them. They'll go to bookstores and say, do you have these? Since there's only 250 and there's like 10,000 bookstores, then the chances of the, there actually being one there, very low. The publisher doesn't want to print more because the bookstores are all skeptical that they can sell them. Uh, they lose money and everyone's sad. Right? The fans who can't get copies are sad. The bookstores are sad because they heard there's this thing um, that they maybe could have sold. The publisher's sad because they lost money. Um, and so the only person that's happy is the author who got to have a cool leather round of their book. Us doing it ourselves 
means that we do not have to have the margins, right? We, we work with uh, some, some, indie, um, some independent bookstores, but we tell them straight up, we're like, we can't give you 50% of cover on these. We just can't, that's cost for us on a lot of these books. And so they're fine because it's a high ticket item since $100, 25% or whatever of cost is still more than they make off of another book. And plus our, my fans are really great and they just go buy them up. So the stores are basically like, yes, it's you just giving us free money. We love that. But being able to directly sell them to the fans means that they can become some, something that we can print like Wave Kings were printing 25,000 copies, which Tor could only sell 250 copies of a Wheel of Time book. And um, that's all through the fact that I'm doing it directly myself. And so this is, this is just a microcosm of, uh, of what you can be doing on your own indie publishing. If you are publishing with the, pub with the big publisher, novellas generally don't make a lot of money with big publishers, but fans do enjoy them. And if you're like me, I really like writing them. Uh, the story of Don Shard is like a really big interlude and it could not fit in Rhythm of War. It just couldn't. I couldn't do a 50,000 word interlude in the middle of that book. It would completely destroy the pacing of that novel. But it's a story I really wanted to tell. Doesn't fit anywhere else. It's a bad deal for, uh, for traditional publishing because it's so short, but the price has to be high because there's so many sunk costs in traditional publishing. And so for them to do this novella, it's like we have to charge a certain amount, we have to make it a hardcover to justify to the fans that we're charging this. And you know, Edge Dancer worked, people like that. It's because of the success of the Stormlight series. But at a slightly less successful um, level, novellas just don't make any money for publishers, but fans like them and authors like them. And indeed, if you self-publish them, they can be great. People can love them. For many years, Emperor's Soul was the highest earning dollar per word story that I had ever written. Um, and uh, I was surprised by that. I didn't expect it because, you know, novellas traditionally in the business just do not make money. But in indie publishing, they can be something really fun to do different. And so at the very least, you should be considering indie publishing your own novellas that are part of your stories if you have a cool story you want to tell and see if it works for you. I don't know if it will. I can't guarantee it will. But like, I really think in this world, you should have more control over your career. You should not be just doing what is done before just because. Be, you should be looking to be in charge of it. Um, and that's a very different thing from when I broke in where there was one way to do it. Um, and even self-publishing was just, even after something like Aragon was just so rare that it was successful, that it was a bad idea. Um, so anyway, well, I, that's a long answer <laughs> to a very simple question, uh, but that's, I could go on a long time about other differences. You should talk to people who have recently broken in though. Oh, I, I have been, and it's, you have a very similar perspective, which is good to hear. And I also imagine one advantage is you have more creative control as well over the look of the leather bound and things like that, which, you know, it's your baby. So I imagine you just like that. It is really nice. Um, a lot of authors feel very disconnected from the final look of their book. The more control you have over your your business, the more you learn about what makes a good cover, and even if you're hiring people to do some of the covers, if the publisher sees that your novella you're releasing has really good cover design, a great uh, co you know cover illustration, and is really connecting with fans, they're gonna listen to you more when you come to them and say, I would really suggest these changes or this artist for the cover art of the books that you're publishing. That's fantastic. And so we are coming up on the time now. I wanna say thank you again so, so much for willing to sit down and do this. If you would like to check out Rhythm of War, of course, there is a million links everywhere to find it, but I will have them in the description down below as well. Thank you so much, Brandon.